Now, good morning. Glad to see everybody here on this cold January Sunday morning. And may the Lord truly bless you and warm your hearts and warm your spirits and set fire the spirit that's within you of the Holy Ghost. And may he open our hearts to receive his word today. But if, you, if you will stand at the reading of God's word, I want to read two scriptures here, one from Jeremiah 6, 7, and then the other one from Deuteronomy eleven nineteen. Deuteronomy six seven. Glad to see all the Bibles. But Moses, in his farewell address to the children of Israel, he's getting ready to turn the reins over to Joshua, and Joshua is going to be leading the people, the children of Israel, into the Promised Land. Moses can't do it because of disobedience. And so he's given his farewell address to the children of Israel and telling them what they need to do. But in Deuteronomy 6, 7 it says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou settest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen 19 says, And ye shall teach them your children, speak of them when thou settest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Teach them. See, this, the oldest generation there probably now may have remembered a little bit the slime pits of Egypt. They may have remembered a little bit about the parting of the Red Sea. They may have remembered a little bit about the deliverance that God did to them on Egypt. But the generations under them, their children, their children's children, and their children's children's children, don't remember. They, didn't, they never saw that aspect of what God done for Israel during that time. And, Je and Moses is trying to admonish them to teach those children, teach your children every time. When you're set at the house, teach them. When you lie down, teach them. Everywhere you go, teach them about the things of God and what God has done for them. Teach them about God. A couple years ago in main camp, the morning Bible teacher was Jeremy Painter. And he told a story and I, I'm assuming he knew this, this guy, uh, and it's, it's been about 17 years ago now since this conversation took place, of this professor in Oklahoma named Joe Monaday, and he was an American Indian. He was of the Kiowa tribe there in Oklahoma. And Joe grew up, born and grew up on the reservation, and he saw the hardships he saw the poverty. He saw everything about growing up on the reservation that turned him off about being a Kiowa Indian. And he didn't want no part of it, even as a young child. He did not want no part of it. And he was kind of ashamed of his Indian heritage, of the Kiowa and the Kiowa heritage. Then one day, he got, as a, as, a child, as a child, he got to leave the reservation to go a to see a parade in a, near, in a neighboring city that was around the reservation. It was a yearly parade that they put on every year for some event. He never said. And so Joe went to that parade, and he watched the parade and all the spectacle behind it. But at the end of the parade, they had two white men that was dressed up as Kiowa Indians. One was drunk, staggering around with a beer in his hand, making an utter fool of himself at the amusement and delight of all the people, the crowd there in the, in the parade. And then the other one, the other white man dressed up as a Kiowa Indian, had a tomahawk and acting like he was chopping and hooping and hollering like they do in the Western movies. And Joe said at that moment, 
he felt a deep shame for Kiowa people, for his Kiowa heritage. He felt a deep shame. He felt like everybody was staring at him in that parade because he was a Kiowa Indian. And young Joe watched, and the shame hit home to him about who he was and what he was. And he determined that one day he was going to get off this reservation and get away from the Kiowa people. And he was going to be like those American white boys that he saw. And that he was determined that. But then come one day before Joe's 16th birthday, his grandfather calls up his mother and says, I want you to bring Joe by in the next morning, early next morning. I want to talk to him. So his mother next morning gets Joe up and drops Joe off at his grandfather's house. And as Joe walks in, his grandfather was a Kiowa chief. And there in his Kiowa tribal outfit and his headdress, he was standing there looking at Joe. And he set Joe down in the middle of the floor. And he started teaching Joe about the Kiowa people before the white man came. He talked to him about the hunts that they used to have, the mythologies of the ancient Kiowa people. He renamed the stars of the constellation after Kiowa heroes. He taught him a little bit about the Kiowa language. He taught Joe Kiowa songs that even though they were new to Joe, they were ancient and passed down for generations and centuries to the Kiowa people. He taught him the ways and the customs of the Kiowa people. And by the time he was, Joe's grandfather was done, his mother came and picked him up to bring Joe home. But in describing that day, on his 16th birthday, Joe looked back upon it with reflection. And he says, I went to my grandfather's house that morning, want nothing more than to be just a white American boy. But I left my father's house, want nothing more than to be a Kiowa Indian. I wanted to be Kiowa. Why? What changed? Heritage, teaching of the Kiowa dialect, the songs the mythologies, teaching him who he was, what he was. He wasn't just another person on the reservation. He was Kiowa, and this is who Kiowa people were. And because of that, it changed and transformed Joe's life. As I listened to that story and the following what Brother Painter ministered on, I thought about my role as a pastor. And I thought about my role as a saint of God. I thought about my role as a father, as a husband. And as I said, as a pastor. And I thought, I want people to know I am apostolic. In everything I am, I am apostolic. I just don't want to tell the Bible stories that's in this Bible with a dull, dry tongue, but I want to teach them the little things about Jesus and the disciples, about the little things that all they did in the Bible that normally isn't touched in a sermon, but yet makes such a profound impact upon the lives of people. I want to add color. I want to add color to these white pages with black lettering on them. That's in between these covers that we call the Holy Bible. I want to add color to that so that they stand out, brilliant and eye-catching about what they are. They're not just stories 
They're not fables. They're not fairy tales. But these are precious truths that God has passed down to us. And sometimes I wonder if we treat it so nonchalant when there's so much heritage here. I want apostolics to know the legacy that we have, who we are, what we are, where we came from, where we're at right now, and where we're going. I want them to know that we're not a dying religion. We're not a religion, but we are an experience with God, and we're not dying. But revival is always here if we just embrace it. Revival is in our young children. Revival is where we want it to be when we want to let God loose in our lives. We're not dying, but we're so very much alive and just as powerful on planet Earth as we've ever been. I want to teach the church, the children, about the rich heritage of this apostolic movement. Not just religion, but an apostolic movement that changes and transforms people's lives. The unique language that is starting to die out, even within our own ranks, the rich heritage of calling one another brothers and sisters instead of calling one another by titles. The rich heritage of telling people receive the Holy Ghost. The rich heritage of telling people you got to get baptized in Jesus' name. And of course, all the rich heritage of whatever we do in word and deed. Do it all in the name of Jesus. That rich heritage. The unique language. The old songs. I want to tell them the stories about Nathaniel Urshan when he was a child. His father, Andrew Urshan, on Sunday mornings there in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, Sunday afternoon, have other apostolic ministers over for a season of prayer. And this one particular Sunday, Brother G.T. Haywood, a black pastor there in Indianapolis, comes into the prayer meeting and said, God's given me a new song. And there he said, Brother G.T. Haywood sang, I see a crimson stream of blood. It flows from Calvary. Its ways, which reach the throne of God, are sweeping over me. These rich heritage that we have, the old songs, the rich stories of our recent forefathers and four women that have paid the price for the freedom that we have today in this apostolic movement. To love the treasures and the rich history, to love this, and the history that's behind us. At least we repeat the other side of history that we don't want. To teach the love of Jesus and the way to love Jesus, the way he wants us to love him, and the way the apostles loved him and gave their lives for him. To convey, to convey the passion, desires, purpose of those that have sacrificed so much to preach, to live this gospel of Jesus Christ in the years gone by. The holiness that they aspired even back then. The revivals that they had the thousands that would come, the healings that took place, and the transformating of the lives that happened. To pass this torch, oh, to pass this torch of amazing power of God's Spirit to the younger generation, not by expecting nothing else but to live our lives in this church and in our community according to the way that God wants us to live. 
and not by the way we want to live, or not by the way we believe God wants us to live, but by the way the Word of God says we live by. To shun sin, not to bring sin into the church, but repent over it and allow the power of God to fall. That is what will transform our young people when they start seeing the demonstrative power of God's Spirit move upon them. That is what will bring even young children down and weep before the altar of God for God to move in even their little lives. To do that, instead of being worried what they're going to do after church, where are they going to eat, or who they're going to hang out with, I want us to feel like every service will be Holy Ghost powered and miracles and healings and deliverances from sin. And I want that to be the norm and not the exception. So that this younger generation below us will know what it's like and not just read about it, but know what it's like. To know what it's like. There's something wrong when God does something and we're startled by it or we're surprised by it. Maybe we really didn't believe it was going to happen. Instead of when it happens, we rejoice in God because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a common thing and we're so thankful that God's visited his people. I want people that I encounter to feel something different about me. To come to our church services feeling something so different that they can't ignore God's will and God's calling for them in their lives. Instead of sitting on a pew and not be moved and walk out, feel the convicting power of God and if they walk out it's because they are determined to live the way they want to live. I want to see people come to our services that they may come in one, nothing more than to be like the world, to dress like the world, to act like the world, to think like the world. But after the power of God falls and moves, they walk out of their service saying, I want nothing more than to be apostolic. I want that power of God in my life. I want to teach our children the rich heritage we have as apostolics. We spend so much time teaching our children how to hunt, how to fish, how to sew, how to cook, how to clean the house, how to work on the car. We spend so much time teaching them how to add and subtract and to write and all this kind of stuff. How much time are we really teaching them about apostolic history? How much are we Bible quizzing them? My youngest daughter was in Bible quizzing. I don't regret it one bit. They learn a lot of scriptures, like 275 scriptures. That's good for them. Are we teaching our children about our heritage? Or are we allowing just Sunday school and the pastor to teach about the Bible? But are we teaching them diligently when they're in the house, when they lay their head down? Or do they hear about how the pastor isn't doing this, or the pastor's not doing that, or the church isn't doing this, or the church isn't doing that? Poison their ears if you want. But I would rather see you teach them about the things of God and what God has done in your life. Give them your testimony. Let them experience their own testimony. For, they, for you will be known as overcomers by the power of your testimony. We spend so much time teaching them on things that has no bearing on eternity and little on eternity itself. To understand to teach our children to understand holiness and why we believe it, why we do this, why we dress, why we talk. Not just tell them that's the way you're going to do it. Or, or mom's four most powerful words is because I said so. That's not teaching them. Teach them why we believe. Could it be because maybe you don't know why you're living for holy like you're living? Or you're just doing it because the pastor said and the church does it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But somewhere you've got to learn it. Somewhere you, it's got to get down inside of you. This is who I am. And why? And your children need to know why. 
whenever they ask a question, whenever you ask the question, you know, when I have a saint of God ask me a question, there's two responses. Either I tell them, I don't know, but I will find out for you. Or it's a great teaching point. It's a great teaching point to teach them something because they're interested. Not just brush them off or just say some half-hearted thing, but teach them. I want our children that are in school. I don't want them to wish that they were like all the other school children, dressed like, and I'm not knocking them, but they're at, well, our children are apostolic. We believe in God. We believe in the move and the power of God. We believe in people getting the Holy Ghost. We believe in people getting baptized in Jesus' name. We believe in the power of God. And so our children, instead of wishing they was like the world, dressing like the world, talking like the world, going where the world is, instead they hold their heads up high and proud that they are apostolic because this is what they believe and they can't explain it to them. And not just tell them, well, that's what mama tells me to do or that's what my dad tells me to do. Let them, let them go to school saying, I want nothing more than to be apostolic. I want them to feel the pride not a haughty pride, but a godly pride of their heritage, of who they are. And why? Why they believe what they believe in. Why? They need to know that. They need to know why. And I, I thought about that. And, you know, could it be that we're losing so many people? Because they come in the church and we tell them this is this, this is that. You can't do this, you can't do that. But we really, really don't teach them. And allow God to cultivate them. And allow God to make them grow. And for us, as the church of the living God, to live it to breathe it, and to firmly be committed to this process. They'll know if you're a hypocrite. They'll know if you're lying. You can't hide that. You might hide it for a while, but eventually God is going to reveal it. We need to get the sin out of church and get the Spirit of God into the church. And even if it means that we got to set some people down, and so be it, because we got to get right. You know, Billy Cole, I've, I've been to several of his, revival, his revivals, and the thing about Billy Cole was every time, the ones I was in at least, every time he started, he'd have everybody kneel down at their chair and ask God to forgive them. Ask God to forgive them. Oh, what a powerful concept. Because we don't know how to forgive. We want to be vindictive. We do something wrong with, uh, if somebody does wrong to us, we want to lash back. We want to show them that I'm no pushover. Or they can't do that to me. Instead of just living a repentant life and say, you know, God forgive them and move on. We need this. How many Joe Monadays out there that it's a shame to be apostolic because they look so different. Instead of explaining to those Joe Monadays why we're apostolic, why we believe what we believe in. Give them your testimony about what God has done in your life. If you're living a different life, those kids will seize that. And you're sending a mixed message to those kids. And so when their wires get crossed, don't blame them. Blame yourself. You can't, you know, you got to, you just can't do, you, you, this isn't do what I say instead of do, don't do what I do, but do as I say. It's not one of these. It said do as I do because I'm doing it myself. Let your, let your actions Speak for you instead of your words. 
And then when your words come out, they will be more powerful than ever. Yes. We need to have more of an experience with God. You need to keep the, the Spirit of God flowing through your life. If you haven't spoken tongues in a while, you need to come down to these altars and get a good tongue lashing because God wants to do something in your life. If you haven't spoken tongues in a while, you need to get on the ball. The field's dry, the well's empty, the crops are withered. They will know you by the fruits that you bear, not by the cross that you wear. They will know you, that you are his disciples. And that's going to take knowing who you are, what you are. Those of you that's listening to this video, I encourage you. I encourage you to keep learning. Keep always thirsty for knowledge and understanding. And God will lead you to people. You may not understand everything. God will lead you to people. Well, God bless you. These altars are open for those who want to come and pray. I encourage you to pray. And allow God to move in your life. God bless you.